guys, it's Jernigan here. We're going to be doing the another Nigel Farage video. I did one before, a big win for the Brexit party, but it didn't bloody we'll kill off all thought go. of a second referendum yeah. because Vince's side will realise they simply can't win it. Uh, and I also think that if if, the, if these opinion polls we're looking at this morning are anything like right, uh, you know, we'll get rid of Mrs May incredibly quickly. We may even see the end of Jeremy Corbyn too. So there are lots of very good reasons, I think. So you, you put out that advertisement. The, the whole day. That wasn't about that. showing was immigrants about. who were, had dark faces. I mean, you know, I, I welcome people right. with dark faces. I was married to one, but uh, people who are coming in from Europe are Europeans. It was giving a totally false picture of what immigration actually amounts to. Now, of course, there was a referendum, um, and they narrowly voted one way. But an enormous amount has happened since that referendum took place. I mean, first of all, it hasn't been possible to get a deal that solves many of the problems that, you know, like the Irish border problem. Uh, those countries that do make use of referendums to support their parliamentary system, and the Swiss, Switzerland is a good example, will have a confirmatory referendum once a deal, once the terms of an arrangement have been negotiated. That's a short video. Of Nigel Farage, we're going to go down and check another one out. When this appalling worst deal in history, new European treaty hove into view, Boris wrote in the Telegraph, quite rightly in my view, that it would lead to vassalage, we become a slave state. And then what did he do? Ah, uh, yes, he voted for it. So he tells us it's appalling, he votes for it, and I worry that Boris puts party loyalty above his own conscience of the country. And even if Boris now says, oh, no, no, it's okay, Nigel, I didn't really mean to vote for it. Well, how can I trust what he says? How can I believe anything any of these two mainstream parties tell us after three years, frankly, of open lies and deceit? Yeah, that's great. Good. Oh, what you would expect. What you would expect. I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it? What you've got happening here is the people, very clearly, now want to leave with a no-deal Brexit, but there are small groups of people who are very, very militant and very angry. And this is because we've had leading politicians not accept the greatest democratic result in the history of our country, and that has radicalised some people. So there are some very strong opinions on both sides of this, but I know where the majority is. And the majority want Brexit finished so we can get on with the rest of our lives. Absolutely disgusting to see. I mean, this from the man who was part of a Labour Party who threw Lord Levy. Uh, we're, we're, shall we say, making a lot of big donors members of the House of Lords? How yeah. dare yeah. he? Yeah. How dare yeah. he? Yeah. Most of our money is being raised by people giving £25 to become registered supporters. And over 100,000, nearly 110,000 of them now have done that. And frankly, this smacks, I think, of jealousy. Because the other parties simply can't do this. Do you feel it is time, though, to, to tell people and just be open? How open can we be? I mean, if you want to come and sit in my office tomorrow, you come tomorrow to my office, I will show you the computer live time with the clicks as £25 at the time comes through from people living, living all over this country. What, what you've got here, what you've got here are the conspiracy theorists doing their utmost to try and delegitimise what is the fastest growing political movement this country's ever seen. Interesting, very interesting indeed. What would say to me? Extremely interesting. This was the milkshake of Nigel Farage who's getting thrown out in one day ago. Right, okay, good stuff. The guy in the glasses fruit milkshake. Oh, Sorry. Yep. The world we live in, eh? <laughs> the world we live in. That's all I can say about that. Yes, and the police have detained somebody um, and charges are going to be pressed. We've simply 
cannot have an entirely radicalised section of our community stopping free speech and political campaigning. I mean, we've reached, we've reached a point now where any sense of normal political campaign can't happen because people are prepared to use violence rather than arguments. Some people claim in the milkshake isn't violence. Really? One person Okay. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Oh man, the things we go through in today to day life things with all sorts of stuff. Right, so just trying to think what I can do now. Thinking away all the time. We were leaving on March the 29th. There was no doubt about it. In fact, our brilliant Prime Minister. Sorry, do you remember that, Mum? <laughs> our brilliant Prime Minister told us over a hundred times we were leaving on March the 29th. The Labour Party told us they would honour the result of the referendum and what we have seen is the most extraordinary political stitch up. It's the only way I can describe it. Our parliament, our government are determined not to give us a clean break Brexit. Very true, very true. Why would I trust Boris Johnson when he told everybody that Mrs May's treaty was awful and then voted for it? So who is Boris Johnson? What does he stand for? Does he, does he actually, you know, if he says something, how can I trust him? How would I know he's really going to do it? Oh, grow up, Mr. Corbyn. Please don't be so silly. There were lots of people standing for us who've been lifelong Labour supporters. They're now Brexit Party candidates, let alone voters. The Labour Party promised in the manifesto in the general election they'd honour Brexit. They are doing everything not to give us Brexit. In fact, most of their MPs now want a second referendum that wouldn't even give us a proper Brexit choice. So I'm afraid Mr. Corbyn's in more trouble in some ways on Europe, even than the Conservatives. Look, we voted for something. We were told the result would be respected. We were told again the next year in a general election, they'd respect the voice of the people and 17.4 million people, the greatest democratic exercise in our history is being overturned by parliament. That's why I founded the Brexit party. That's why I'm here today in South End. That's why we're leaving the opinion polls. <laughs> Nigel Farage's bus fighting back on his opinion. So I'm trying to find a, another video. For somebody who doesn't believe in Europe, who don't believe in the European Union, don't believe in what's going on over there, you seem very keen to be a representative of them. It doesn't make sense, does it? Oh, far from it. I spent 20 years trying to get rid of my job as an MEP. I thought I'd succeeded. We had a referendum. We were told the result would be implemented. And what has happened? There's been a betrayal of trust by Parliament, by our government. Uh, that vote, uh, the can keeps getting kicked down the road. So now is the time to fight back. Because for the last three years, the one voice that's been missing in all of this has been that of the people. Well, on May the 23rd, they're going to get the opportunity. And the Brexit party clearly unequivocally believes we should leave the European Union. And what are you going to be campaigning for exactly? What are the things, what are the issues that you're going to be discussing? What's going to get you over the line? Uh, democracy. Democracy should matter. I mean, goodness me, Westminster used to be known as the mother of parliaments. And here we are behaving, frankly, like a banana republic, ignoring the views of the people. So we want to bring democracy back to this country. We want to bring trust back to this country because if trust breaks down between the governors and the governed and that can't be a healthy thing for our society and what we're going to do is put before the british people a group of men and women many of them who've been very successful in business many of them who know how to do a deal and we're going to say we need more competent people but don't think of this as the brexit party just standing in the european elections this is just the beginning of a new political movement we want a political revolution in this country. The two-party system is broken. It doesn't work. And frankly, the House of Commons no longer represents this country. So this is a so, first step. So
So, 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 I'm very ambitious. I'll grant you a tenth to change the country. So this time, Nigel Farage, we're not going to hear massive anti-immigration rhetoric, anti-immigration campaigning, because you said recently the reason why you managed to be successful in the last Brexit campaign was immigration as an issue was the single most important point. So you're promising us now there won't be any of that in your campaign now, and in fact you'll, probably, you'll be, be very welcome into the whole immigration debate, because as we know, we need EU nationals here, what? and we need EU immigrants here, don't we? <laughs> no, no, we do not need complete open borders. We do not need to go on discriminating against people from India or Australia. We need a much fairer, better immigration system. Of course we do. But the salient point now is not immigration. It is trust and democracy. There are millions of people out there who literally feel betrayed by politicians, who've broken promise after promise. We're going to fight to re-establish that trust. Because after all, that is what we're supposed to be as a country. And in the eyes of the world, we're turning into a laughing stock. We are going to try um, to reverse that. Let's bring in Alexandra in the studio here. Um, what Nigel Farage is saying there is something that is being echoed in parties uh, around Europe, isn't it? He's not alone in seeing that democracy is being seen as failing people. I'm not sure, you know, that there's... there's there's been a habit at European level is that national politicians project at European level all their failures and say this is Brussels fault, this is Brussels fault, this is Brussels fault, instead of looking at themselves. And the truth is that there isn't a single decision taken by the European Union which doesn't go through both all the leaders of the European Union, who are all democratically elected, and the European Parliament at the same time. Now that's democratic validation. The Commission doesn't choose anything. She just proposes something which is then validated by democratic institutions. Are there parties across Europe who are unhappy with the things? There are lots the way of things are? Sort of parties Absolutely. on the right who are succeeding. That's why we have a European election. They will have the opportunity to voice that anger, and electors will have a choice. Would, would, would you rather that we left with no deal than have someone like Nigel Farage back in the European Parliament disrupting things? Because he enjoys that. As I, I know he's there still and listening, and I know he enjoys that sort of conflict and that combative thing. You know, would you rather, it would Emmanuel Macron, rather we just left with no deal? I don't think that's precisely it. I mean, if the European elections return MPs who defend their opinions. If they object to the European Union, they will object and vote against it. That's completely fine, and there will be any MPs like that. But Macron has been worried, hasn't he, about what no, that, that would there be. Is, there is a difference with a member state whose main policy is to leave the yes. EU and its ability to influence decisions. It's very clear, listen, if your main policy is to leave the EU, it's very odd that you would be voting a budget which basically sets up the next seven years of the EU project. So there are some decisions like the new commission. The new commission is going to be chosen. That's why the new Brexit date is Halloween date or the end of October, because at that point we will need to choose a new commission. And it would be very odd to have a country whose main policy is to leave the EU participate in choosing the president of the next European Commission. But so we'll there, do are that, won't we? there are decisions where yeah. I think the UK will have to take a back step, a step back on decision making, and it has agreed to that in the Council conclusions which it signed yesterday. And um, but in the European Parliament, MEPs are free to do what MEPs or MPs do, which is express their opinion and object to what they disagree with. Um, Macron has taken quite a hard stance. The feeling was that when this date came about, of October the thirty first, it was seen as a victory for Emmanuel Macron, as opposed to giving the longer date, as others may have wanted or agreeing to what Theresa May wanted. Um, we always think, or the, the conversation here from Remainers and others, is that no deal will be terrible for this country. That's what the Treasury's been saying. Um, what would be the impact of that if that were to still happen on France? Because it would be bad for them as well as us, would it? The opinion? impact is negative on everyone. Uh, it, it's, I mean, there's been a very consistent you know, line taken by everybody across the 27 member states from the beginning of the referendum campaign here is that the impact is negative on anyone. Now, depending on the solution that you take, the impact is more or less negative. And Brexit, for us, in our view, is the worst solution for everyone collectively. Now, that being said, it's very clear today that that decision lies in London. It is a UK domestic problem, and it's up to UK politicians to decide what they want. We need, okay. as Europeans, a parliament who can express a will, a desire of one path forward, not just a rejection of every of path. Every other option. Well, let's go back to Nigel Farage. Um, are you, firstly, are you a no-deal Brexit party? And secondly, are you afraid that we might not ever leave? Uh, well, look, you know, I, for 25 years, campaigned for a free trade 
deal with the European Union. I was a businessman for 20 years before getting involved in politics, but it's all too late for that. So now what we have to do, leave on WTO terms. After all, that's how we do most of our business with the rest of the world. Free ourselves from these political institutions, become a genuine, independent, self-governing nation. And you know something, very shortly after we've left, the European Union will come running down the road after us wanting a free trade deal. Am I worried that Brexit will never happen? Well, if it's left in the hands of this Remainer Parliament, Brexit may never happen, which is why the people must take back control of this process. And what you're seeing out in the country is there are more people now want to leave on WTO terms than any other option. So I think uh, the irony of, the, of this extension is, is, is that it's going to rebirth I don't think Europe will Europe come Europe. running after anyone. I mean, the, the, the fact is, at the moment, Europe is quite comfortable with any alternative proposed or signed on to by the UK. I was responsible for a bill to prepare France in case of no deal. The country is absolutely prepared for a no deal scenario. It doesn't mean that there are no impacts, but it means we can deal with those impacts or with the gravest of them. So when Nigel Farage says that down the road, if we can leave on uh, World Trade Organization rules and tariffs, that the European Union will fold and will come Listen, running back. The European Union something. is the first biggest market in the world for the moment in terms of economic might. It will be the second if the UK leaves. I think it's very clear that the UK, the European Union can survive very well without the UK. Fascinating. You both seem to agree that no deal isn't a big deal. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I said. We've prepared. There's, there's a difference being prepared. I prepared is a train can go from France to the UK, won't stop in the middle. That's being prepared. It doesn't mean that the price of the train will be the same. It doesn't mean that the controls that you will get, the ticket will be the same. It doesn't mean that you will not queue at the entrance. It just means that it will still be there. That's being prepared. It doesn't mean that there is no impact. There's a, those are very different things. Do you worry about Nigel Farage being back in the European Parliament? No, I don't worry about Nigel Farage being back in Parliament. I am convinced that what Europe needs is a real debate in the European Parliament. And I think it's very good that all sensibilities and all political opinions are represented in that parliament. So I welcome anybody who wants to run for the European election. There you go. Well, Nigel Farage, apparently they'll welcome you with open arms back in the European Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I've made their lives more interesting. But look, the choice is very, very simple, isn't it? Either you want to live in Monsieur Macron's Europe, with a United States of Europe, with a European army, with all power vested in the centre in Brussels, mostly in the hands of unelected people, or you believe in being an independent, self-governing nation-state. That is the European debate in a sentence. That's very true. That is very true indeed. This is our lab, where our scientists have extracted a precious molecule, lavender. And when I began to realize back in November, December, that extension was almost certain to come, that there would be more European elections, I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a party. I'm going to call it the Brexit party. But given that it's the most Googled word in the English language, I wonder whether the Electoral Commission will allow me to use the name. Well, they have. And you are here today at the birth, at the launch of a new force in British politics. Welcome to the Brexit Party. All over the world, people look on with incredulity because they still think that we're a great country. And the funny thing is that we, the people, still think that we're a great country. But our leaders, our leaders are happy to continue down the path of managed decline. I, will, I genuinely yeah. believe right now this nation, what? we are lions led by donkeys. <laughs> What's happened is our two-party system simply can't cope with Brexit. I think our two-party system has been exposed, frankly, as being unfit for purpose. I think we have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. I did say that if I ever had to come back into the political fray, next time, it would be no more Mr. Nice Guy. And I mean it. I mean it. I mean it. I am, I'm an, yes, I'm angry about what's happened. I know lots of people out there are angry. But this is not, as I say, a negative emotion. This is a positive emotion. We're going to use these elections to change things. I said many years ago that I wanted to cause an earthquake 
in British politics. Well, now what I'm fighting for, and with your support, what we will attempt to achieve is a democratic revolution in British politics, because that is what we need. Indeed, yeah. I agree with him. We'll do some Nigel Farage videos, guys, ITV. Open Society is his organisation. It is the biggest political campaigning group in Financial Times the world has ever seen. It's already raised $15 billion. Another $18 billion have been pledged. So whether George Soros managed to get other donors to support him on that night, frankly, is irrelevant. Well, it's we quite talk... relevant when it comes to this no, anti-Brexit campaign. It's completely irrelevant because he can sign as big a check as he wants. This man interferes in elections and referendums all over the Western world. Uh, okay, but he has a right to campaign on, on what he uh, wants to, and there's no rules being broken here. No, I think, you know, we talk about Russian collusion. Did the Russians interfere in the American election? Did they interfere in yeah, Brexit? This, this is not that is, anything that is, on that this is This is the biggest political campaigner in the history of the world, and what happened today is a few people have started to wake up to it. Now, it's it's interesting, the rules, part, the part but, of the reason but, apparently for this is to um, secure a second referendum mm, on whether we leave or whether we stay in. Now, we have an argument, don't we, when you come in about um, whether there should be a second referendum, and the point is that we don't yet know the deal that Theresa May is going to secure with Brussels. And what happens, you know, even you're so critical of the Prime Minister. What yeah. happens if she comes up with a deal that you, as someone who is such a vocal and successful campaigner in the Brexit referendum, thinks that's a rubbish deal and we're going to end up worse? The referendum, Wouldn't you like to have a chance to vote on it? It wasn't about an economic deal. It wasn't about projecting whether in 15 years' time we'll be richer or poorer, because frankly no one knows. The referendum was about leaving the political union being an independent, self-governing So nation. you don't care if the deal is a really I bad deal? I, I'm very pessimistic about the deal she's going to get, because it's pretty clear. You would he, rather won't give have us a, a bad want, deal no, no, than consider staying... I want staying to be an independent country. And once you are an independent country, you can change anything you want in the future. That is what the referendum was about. I don't want a second referendum, but I sat there with you just a month ago, yeah. warning that I thought there would be a second referendum, and this kind of fits into that, this Soros story. Let's speak to Philippe Lomé about that uh, in Strasbourg. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Just on that subject, is a second referendum, yeah. the idea of, of the UK having another vote on this, that's something that you would welcome? Well, frankly speaking, if you want to keep the United Kingdom as close as possible to the European Union, I'm not sure that pushing for a second referendum is the best strategy, because the question is, of course, when would you hold it? And, well, we are going to have a withdrawal deal by the date uh, of, the, of, of Brexit, that is next March. Uh, but you won't have a clear idea as to the future relationship for many years to come, because you need to negotiate it. So, in other terms, people won't be able to know exactly what they will be voting on. My preferred strategy would be to say, let's negotiate in good faith, let's have a transition period that is long enough to allow us to negotiate the future relationship and then maybe at that time we can decide how to approve the the, the deal that will that will have negotiated have been negotiated at that time Philip Lomba, but is I, it possible I believe that you, you, doing a, a second referendum before the date say again no it's just, i'm sorry there's a slight delay on the la uh, on the line is there a possibility yeah. do you yeah. think because you're on uh, one of the key brexit uh, committees the EU Brexit Steering Committee. Is it possible to have a good deal, do you think, for both the EU and the UK? Because there is a suspicion, and there was a leak yesterday of a document which suggests that the EU is going to punish uh, the UK during the transition deal. There is this suspicion amongst some people that the EU wants the UK to do badly, perhaps to stop other people doing the same as the UK has done and voting to leave the EU. That we can't be seen to benefit from Brexit because it would lead to the breakup of the EU. So first, uh, are there politicians uh, on this side of the channel wanting to punish uh, the United Kingdom? Yes, I, I think that such people exist. Are they the majority? By far not. I think that what people realize is that the best deal for the UK and the European yeah. Union is to stay together. So anything uh, uh, beneath that, well, lower than that, 
is a lose-lose game. So the EU27 are losing by the departure of the UK and the UK will be losing by quitting the European Union in terms of influence and in terms of wealth. So that's a fact. So anything uh, uh, lesser than membership is a lose-lose game. So that's a fact. So how do you limit damage? That is the question. That is the question. And my plea is for the closest possible uh, association between the UK and the European Union, and that means membership of the single market and membership of the customs union. That's the best we can get. And, and, and from your perspective, Nigel, I imagine you disagree. Uh, interesting that you said there are MEPs that would like to punish oh, plenty of the them. UK, yeah, but, but, no, but in the minority. Uh, my worry is Monsieur Barnier, their chief negotiator, wants to punish the UK. You know, I met him a few weeks ago, I sat with him in his office. Oh, no. They are not, not, not going to give us a rounded trade deal on goods and services. He's made that perfectly clear. So it seems to me we're beginning to get to the point where we're wasting our time. Why spend years in transition if actually they don't, they don't want to come to a sensible arrangement? Maybe better to have a quick, clean break and get on with our destiny well, with the rest of the world. Because if you're a business leader, that might so strike fear into eight, your heart. Eighty-five percent of the global economy is outside the eurozone. There are some big, exciting places out there. team uh, for laying out a case, an impassioned case for democracy, a case from the Czech Republic uh, for Euroscepticism, and interestingly, so often it's portrayed that the Eurosceptics are backward little Englanders, and what you'll notice is that Eurosceptic parties, many on the far left, on the far right, some of the centre, but they're growing across the whole of Europe. And what a thrill to see Mr Barroso again. After... <laughs> For nearly 10 years, we sat next to each other in the European Parliament, and I was so reassured that you told me there was no plan to take away the statehood of the individual members. I must have misheard it when you said three years ago that we were building the world's first non-military empire. Clearly, I got that wrong. Um, and what fun to have another debate with Nick Clegg, um, a very different Nick Clegg to last year, clearly not being Deputy Prime Minister has done you, as a person, an absolute power of good. Um, <laughs> and that's um, It's also brought out the real you politically, uh, which of course is Euro fanatic. You know, the College of Bruges, the European Commission, the European Parliament. Uh, but I'm sorry, Nick, uh, you laid out a series of things that we know, that we know foreign and direct investment would fall into this country, that we know Britain would be a less safe place. And frankly, we don't know any of those things. You know, I will, I will accept, I will accept that none of us know what the future is. None of us know what the risks are if we leave the European Union. None of us know what the risks are if we stay in the European Union. It is about making a decision. But I think tonight is a moment perhaps to examine that relationship between Britain and the European Union. I want you please to think of Britain and the EU being like an old married couple. They fell in love and got married in their late teens. 40 years they've been together. In the early days it was pretty good, but it's been getting increasingly rotten over the last 25 years. Of course, a lot of people said, no, 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 you must stay with him. Oh, I know he's a terrible bully. I know he makes all the rules and the laws in the house. I know he forbids you from making your own friends. But surely, <laughs> but surely it's better that you stay together. And some who perhaps tended towards her side, they vexed themselves with a question. Could she cope on her own? Was she really up to it? Could she manage her own shopping basket and run her own life? And this debate went on between their friends for years. In the end, it was decided quite sensibly they should go for marriage guidance counselling. And they went to a great big building in Brussels. 
and there was a sign on it outside that said Council of Ministers. And into this building they went, and on 40 different bitter disputes on all 40 occasions, the court ruled in favour of the husband. She'd lost 40 times out of 40, and so they did then decide to go for a quick, swift, amicable divorce. Well, a couple of years have gone by now, and initially it was quite difficult. There were things to do, lots to tidy up, but I can report that now she has blossomed. She has made new friends right across the rest of the world. She's got her own self-confidence back, and she's in charge of her own life, making her own choices for good or bad, which is as it should be for any individual or for any nation. And that, folks, is our relationship with the European Union. It is now a terrible, terrible drag for this country. This baloney we heard about Britain not being big enough to negotiate its own trade deals on the world stage. How on earth, we were asked by Nick, how on earth are we big enough to go and negotiate with, with China or India or anybody else? Well, unless you hadn't noticed two years ago, Iceland, with a population of 317,000, negotiated their own bilateral free trade deal with, with China. I put it to you folks, that if Iceland's big enough to make its own trade deals, the United Kingdom is big enough to make its own trade deals. And the argument, the argument about the single market, championed uh, by all of our speakers, and Anna, of course, who I'm sure we're going to see much more of uh, as this referendum develops, but the argument that we have to be part of this wonderful, burgeoning single market, that we can't have our cake and eat it. Well, think of it, folks, like this. Just 15% of Britain's gross domestic product is engaged in the manufacture and sale of goods and also services to the European Union. And yet we're part of a single market that regulates 100% of British business. We are over-regulating our industries, we are lumbering our manufacturing industries with expensive energy. We are crippling much of our financial services industry, which is leaving. It's going off to Bermuda and Singapore and Zurich and elsewhere. We don't need to be governed and regulated from somewhere else. And frankly, it's rather expensive being a member of this club. Whether you look at gross figures or net figures, what on earth are we doing paying a net 11 billion pounds a year to the European Union. Now I accept that those that have worked for the European institutions will benefit from very good pensions later. Oh, I suppose, I suppose I'm one of those as well, I guess. But, but, but you know, other than, other than it benefiting one or two individuals, what on earth are we talking about? We shouldn't be paying them. They sell us 800,000 motor cars a year more than we sell them. The streets of Oxford are full of shiny, bright German motor cars. We shouldn't be paying a membership fee to the European club. They, frankly, should be paying us. And when it comes to open borders, should we just try and get this right? Nobody on our side of the argument is arguing against the concept or the idea of work permits for people who've got skills. No one's arguing against immigration. What we're arguing for is the control of immigration. And please think of it like this. In the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, until Tony Blair became prime minister, net migration to Britain ran at 30,000 people a year. It is now running at a third of a million people a year. It is running at 10 times the number that it ever did before. And what we're arguing, yes, do. Sir, note that the very fact that many of the economic qualities and experiences of the UK right now rest upon the fact that it is the entry to the market of the greater European Union, and that is why investors, producers, manufacturers 
risk it come to UK in the status quo. The comparative is when you leave the EU, there's no longer the incentive for these individuals to come and invest as much towards Wow. Now let me tell now let me tell you, old son. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, I heard that self same argument in this room fifteen years ago. Nick Nick wasn't here, but the people the proposition fifteen years ago when I was here was that this house thinks it'd be good for the British economy to join the Euro. And the arguments I heard from that side were that unless Britain was in the Euro, there'd be no foreign and direct investment in Britain. The City of London would close down. It would be a disaster. Can I just say, thank God we didn't join the Euro and those arguments were wrong then and they're wrong now. Let us have, let us have, let us have an immigration policy based on the Australian style point system. Let's have people that come to Britain, but let's stop discriminating. Let's stop discriminating against people who are engineers from India or doctors from New Zealand in favour of large mass unskilled migration from Southern and Eastern Europe, which whilst it may benefit the big corporates and the big employers, has not benefited our communities or ordinary workers in this country. Yes, do. How on earth do you feel the, the gaps in jobs that are created? The fact, simple fact that British people are not willing to take these unskilled jobs. We rely on this immigration to create unskilled jobs. And also your point on, um, on work permits. That's insinuating the idea that most people who come to this country, who migrate to this country, don't work. That is just completely untrue. No, it's not. No, it's not. So, so can we, again, can we please talk about normality? There are 200 countries in the world who, if you want to get a job, you get a work permit. You have to prove you haven't got a serious criminal record. You have to take your own health insurance. That is how it works, working globally. We've thrown all of that out of the window. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that people who come here don't want to work. Most of them do. But let me tell you, there has actually become a case where wages for British workers in many jobs have been driven down so low, they've no incentive to get off benefits and back to work. And that is not good. Not everybody in this country is bright enough to go to Oxford. And we should think about some of those people in our society too. My point folks is this, we don't need to be dragged down by the European Union. We can do much better than this. When they tell us we can't do this and we can't do that, and we have more influence on the world stage, what this side of the house really means is we're not good enough. They don't believe in this country. They don't believe in our ability to make our own laws and to make our own trade deals. Ultimately, this referendum will be settled, I believe, on the issue of safety and security. And I totally accept the points that Bill made earlier about Schengen. The free movement of peoples in Europe has become the free movement of criminals and the free movement of Kalashnikovs and the free movement of terrorists. And frankly, the idea that the fact that three of the Paris killers got in through the Greek islands posing as migrants, but we're told, don't worry, it's all okay, they're EU citizens, sir, that is worse because it means any one of them could have got on a Eurostar and come to London. They could have chosen London for the site of that terrorist attack and not Paris. And I don't for one moment disagree with the arguments here that we have homebred problems in our country with jihadism. We do, but for the European Union to have opened its doors unconditionally, you've had your go, sit down, old son. Um, <laughs> To unconditionally open doors to hundreds of thousands of people a year risks bringing more terror to Britain. It is actually going to get worse. And let me tell you why it's going to get worse. When Mr. Barroso talked about building an empire, he meant it. We now want to fast track Turkey as a member of the European Union, a country 97% of which is in Asia. But never mind, there's a join. With the free movement of people, of another 75 million people and worryingly a country with a fantastic amazing secular history throughout nearly the whole of the 20th century and one sadly 
that has seen a huge rate of change. 8% of people in Turkey today have strong sympathy with ISIS. It's up to us. But in the end, this referendum will be decided in this country. Are we safer? Are we better managing our own borders, looking after our own security, or being part of this union? As far as the EU is concerned, it was Roy Jenkins back in 98 who said, you know, we should not be a constantly foot dragging, well, he didn't pronounce the R quite like that, but a constantly foot dragging member of the European Union. Either we embrace it wholly or we decide to leave it and let them get on with their job. I know that Britain leaving the EU would be greeted with great cheers by Mr. Verhofstadt and Mr. Schultz and many others. They can then press on. Friends of the die and we go in a minute. Of nation state democracy without perhaps as many objecting voices. I plug the phone in. Honestly, that's not my mission. I'll put the wire in the and phone. If for the EU we be the peoples of Europe, then not only would Britain be better not being part of this union, but the rest of Europe would be too. A British divorce from this and the renegotiation of a sensible free trade agreement, I think, would change the whole of the rest of Europe too. I want a Europe of trade. I want a Europe of cooperation. I want a Europe where we have reciprocal deals on students and we agree common, sensible minimum standards. I don't want a Europe of the European Commission, of the flag, of the anthem and of open borders. Let's have a Europe of nation states that trade together and let's grip this opportunity of a British referendum to make it happen. Thank you. Right. I hope you enjoyed the Nigel Farage video, guys. That was a. Uh, I'm bringing up some old videos and some new videos to mix them up into the video that I'm doing. That's what I've been doing, as you can see. Thank you for joining this broadcast, and I hope you've all enjoyed it. I'll be doing some more of this later. Please like, comment, subscribe, share these videos with your friends, and uh, subscribe to the new speaker every week. Okay, and uh, see you in the next one, guys. Peace.